is Ryan. I'm the youth pastor here. Um, so I do want to say, hey, I would love to meet you. If you are a 7th through 12th grader, if you have a 7th through 12th grader, I would love to meet you. Um, I'll try and be out in the table in the lobby after service uh, to talk about also camp. Um, but hey, we're going to be in Luke 5 this morning. So why don't you open up to Luke chapter 5. And as you're turning there, um, I, I just want to say I almost uh, didn't preach this morning, uh, not because of the time change, but actually because I had my wisdom tooth surgery scheduled for last Monday. Um, and so I, I had my wisdom tooth surgery scheduled, and they told me that uh, you can't drink or you can't uh, eat any food or drink any drink. And, and I just thought that that meant like soda or coffee or something. I didn't know that that meant water. How many of you have had your wisdom teeth out before? Okay. So I had no idea. So um, I, I'm I'm Riding with Morgan to the uh, wisdom tooth surgery, and I'll just be honest, it's one of the, my weaker moments in the last couple months, and I, I was just, we're driving, and I'm terrified. I've never had any medical procedure, and I just, I was in the car, like, just tell me it's going to be okay, babe. Just tell me it's going to be okay. And does anyone's mouth get dry when they're nervous? So I, I'm, drink, I'm just drinking water all the way to my surgery appointment because my mouth is so dry. So I actually drank this 24-ounce container twice. Um, in the morning before nine. And so I show up for my appointment and they see me holding the water and they're like, have you been drinking water? And I'm like, well, yes, I'm terrified. I can't be terrified and not eat or drink. Like, and, and so we have to reschedule my surgery for May. So any, any planners in the room? Any planners? Uh, any planners who get discouraged when their plans change? <laughs> okay, so I, I had my whole week planned out, but I got discouraged because I had to change it. And we're going to read Luke chapter 5 this morning, which is a story uh, where the disciples' plans change. And there's some discouragement that comes. So if you want to read along with me, we'll have it on the screens. Uh, but in Luke chapter 5, it says this. It says, Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out from them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put it out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for the catch. And Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. And so Jesus meets the disciples in this moment of discouragement. And I just wonder this morning how many of us are in a similar valley moment where we're discouraged. And my question this morning is, how is Jesus going to meet us in those moments of discouragement? Let's pray before we really dive in. Why don't you bow your heads, close your eyes. Lord, we thank you for your presence that's in the room, your presence that was so clear in worship. And Lord, as we open up your word this morning, God, we invite you to speak to us in a fresh way. Um, Lord, we just pray for a softening in our hearts. You know, just with eyes closed, if you're in this room and you're saying, you know what, I, my, my heart has felt a little hard, um, and I just want the Holy Spirit to come and soften my heart, just close your eyes and just slip your hand up if that's you. I'd love to pray for you. God, we just pray for a softening of our hearts this morning to hear what you're speaking to us in a fresh way. Lord, I pray for every person who's walked into this room discouraged. We pray we'd find our hope in you this morning. In Jesus' name, and everyone said... Amen. Hey, so we're in this series called Life in the Kingdom. Uh, Life in the Kingdom, finding triumph in your test. And what this series is going to be, we started it last week, but it's going to be a journey uh, through the Gospel of Luke. And it's going to be kind of like, has anyone ever been on an airplane when it's landing on the runway and it kind of bounces a couple times on the runway? So it's going to be like that through the book of Luke. We're going to touch down in just a few different stories uh, talking about God's kingdom, and we're going to end it at Easter with one of the most beautiful kingdom stories of all, Jesus' death and resurrection. But each time we talk, uh, we're going to talk about triumphs and testing, testing and triumphs. So last week, Pastor Brandon shared an amazing message on Luke chapter 4 uh, on the test of being in the wilderness. I know a lot of us have had wilderness seasons in our life, but the triumph of God's leadership in that. And this morning, uh, we're going to talk about the test of discouragement and the triumph. Well, you have to wait till the end of the message to find out what the triumph 
is. So stay till the end. Don't sneak out. Um, but just, we're going to understand uh, the book of Luke and kingdom in the book of Luke. So I just want to look at a couple places where Luke talks about the kingdom so, so we can kind of put our, our, our glasses on, so to speak, to understand what it is Luke talks about when he talks about kingdom. So the first time he says the word kingdom is in Luke chapter 1, verse 33. And this is the angel Gabriel talking to Mary and Joseph, telling them they're going to give birth to Jesus. And he says he, talking about Jesus, will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And so uh, really when Luke starts off his book, one of the major themes about the kingdom of God is that when Jesus's feet touch the earth, the kingdom of heaven arrives. And the kingdom has a king, and his name is Jesus, and it's this eternal kingdom of God of which there's no end. And so that kind of sets the stage for kingdom in Luke. It's that the kingdom is here. And in Luke chapter 4, uh, Jesus is preaching, and he says to them, I pro must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So Jesus reiterates, the kingdom is here, and I I'm preaching about the kingdom, and really what Luke is saying is Jesus is the king of the kingdom that is here. But what I love about Luke, though, is for him, it's always an upside-down kingdom. For Luke, the kingdom of God is a kingdom where, where the sinner is made a saint. For Luke, the kingdom of God is a kingdom where the sick are healed, where the poor are provided for, and where the outcasts are welcome to the table of God. It's an upside on kingdom, and it's never really quite what we're expecting it to be. And so we see that in this story in Luke chapter 5, which really is a kingdom story. And so Jesus is teaching, and there's crowds gathering around him to hear the word of God. And he sees some boats. And so he actually, the crowds are pressing in on him so much uh, that he actually gets into a boat on the lake. And then it says that he sits down, uh, which actually reflects a rabbinical style of teaching. So Jewish rabbis would often sit while their crowds would stand. Um, and so I thought we could copy the model of the Jewish rabbis rabbis this morning. If you guys want to stand, I would love to sit and just sip some coffee, but no, obviously we don't do it that way. But that's why Jesus sits. He sits because that's just the way they did it. Everyone else is standing. Uh, and he's going to do an object lesson or an illustration. And so he asked Simon to, to put the nets in the water. And you can almost hear the discouragement in Simon's voice when he says, Master, we've worked all night long and have caught nothing. And Jesus meets them at this discouraging moment. So my wife and I had the awesome opportunity to go to Atlanta this last week. She was there for a uh, worship school. I was there for a preaching school. And it was absolutely life-changing. But one day we had an afternoon off in Atlanta. And uh, Atlanta, is, uh, has anyone ever been to Atlanta before? It's this big, sprawling city with not the best public transportation. And so some tech startups have come in, and they've put these uh, scooters, these electric scooters, all across the city. And it's kind of crazy. You could, they just leave them there. So there's just random scooters parked all throughout the city, and then you get the app on your phone uh, that you download, and it'll mobily unlock the scooter, and then you can ride the electric scooter. And I actually think, I heard that we have these in Midtown Sacramento now, um, but they, they had them in Atlanta, so I was at Morgan and I's first time seeing them, and so I was getting frustrated with how much Uber was costing, and so I'm like, hey, we're, we're going to go. It's 10, 10 minutes away. We're just going to ride the scooters to where we have to go. So we have to find the scooters. We get the app. We mobily unlock it. We both get scooters, except what happens is I, I get a scooter, or or she, Morgan gets a scooter that has a lower battery level than mine. And so I, I just go, and I go on my scooter, and poor Morgan is stuck trying to catch up with me. And so she, she waves me down, and she's like, hey, we need to switch. Like, I, I need the one with better battery. And I'm like, okay, fine. So we switch, and we're at the bottom of the hill when we switch, okay? So we switch at the bottom of the hill, and then Morgan just rides away from me off up the hill, leaving me to uh, manually push my electric scooter <laughs> up the hill. Um, and I was pretty uh, discouraged at that point. <laughs> and uh, eventually we get to the top. I wave her down. I'm like, babe, we got to find a different scooter. And so it takes us over 30 minutes uh, to find another scooter. The journey takes us an hour and a half. And I tell you, that discouragement, I got desperate just trying to find another scooter, get the right app, download it. And really, I think it's this funny, it's a funny picture, I know, but it's a picture uh, of what God does in our life through discouragement is discouragement can bring us to a place of desperation. 
Does that make sense? Discouragement. God can use discouragement in our life to bring us to a place of desperation to say, the way that I was doing things isn't going to work anymore. I need a new way to do this. And that's the moment that Jesus and the disciples reach, is they reach this moment of the way we've been casting the nets isn't going to work anymore. And you can almost hear uh, or see Simon roll his eyes and say, yet if you say so, I'll let down the nets. And so they try again. And when they had done this, it says they caught so many fish that their nets begin to break. And so they signal to their partners who are in the other boat to come and help them. And they come and filled both boats and both boats begin to sink. There's so many fish. Do we realize this probably takes some time? Like they got to wave down the people in the other boats. Those boats have to row over to this boat. They've got to pick these massive fish up. I mean, can you imagine how bad that smelled? It's just all these fish overflowing in the boats. And so it's smelly, it's heavy, and they get all these boats. And, and, but Simon Peter, um, it, it says, but then Simon Peter saw it, and he fell down at Jesus' knees. And Peter goes from a moment of discouragement to devotion to Jesus. And here's what I want to ask us this morning is, is our discouragement leading us to or away, or to or from Jesus' feet? Is our discouragement leading us to devotion to Jesus? And he finds himself at Jesus' knees and says, uh, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. So Jesus does this miracle. He does this sign. He does this wonder. He multiplies the fish. The boats get filled with fish. But for Luke, it's never about the sign and the wonder by itself. It's always about the person the sign is pointing to. And so Peter doesn't get enamored by the sign, but he lets the sign point him straight to the feet of Jesus. And it's this unexpected, because this isn't how he expected the Messiah to show up with this multiplying fish miracle. In fact, it's kind of weird if you think about it. Like this is how the Messiah is revealing himself to Peter is by multiplying fish. But that unexpected miracle in the valley of discouragement is what leads Peter to his knees. Isn't that so like God to do something unexpected in the middle of our discouragement, in the middle of our wilderness that leads us to our knees? It's kind of like um, many of us know a story about uh, a, a hero who has to go on a journey, and he goes on this journey into a wilderness, uh, and, and that wilderness for this particular hero, and again, many of you know this story, it looks like this jungle, and it's swamps, and there's fog, and he's supposed to meet uh, this mentor figure who's going to train him in, in the ways of his people, and so he's looking for this mighty warrior, and then what shows up is this little green alien who takes him to a cave and says, I'm the mentor you're looking for. That story is, of course, Star Wars. We're talking about Luke Skywalker and Yoda. Anyone seen Star Wars? So it's this moment, and it's just a funny illustration, I know, but it's this moment where, where Luke is looking for this warrior mentor, but then what shows up in this little green alien, and it's just not what he was expecting in the same way God likes to show up in our wilderness, not as a warrior a lot of times, but sometimes he wants to show up as a servant. Sometimes we're in the middle of our valleys waiting for God to show up as a savior, but instead he shows up as a shepherd. And instead of leading us out of the wilderness, he says, I want to lead you through it. It's really similar to the story of the people of Israel, where that, uh, hundred, just 500 years before the, Luke writes, uh, the people of Israel were marched away into exile as slaves. So they're marched away. So the great-great-grandparents of the people in this story were marched away as slaves into another nation. They were marched away into Babylon. Ultimately, the Persian Empire takes over the Babylonian Empire. The exiles get to go home, but then the Greek Empire takes over with Alexander the Great, and then the Roman Empire takes over. And so we find ourselves with the people in this story, the descendants of slaves, and they're still ruled by a foreign power. There's no Jewish king on the throne of the land. If we think about the story of Israel, which is the story we're coming into, Israel's really at the bottom of their valley moment waiting for a king who's going to come and be the Jewish king on the throne. And God comes as a king, but not as a warrior king. He comes as a king that washes the feet of his disciples. 
And in the same way, God shows up in our lives. And so here's the, the test is the test of discouragement. But the triumph is not that God delivers us out of the valley, but that he leads us through it. And I think some of us in the room this morning need to know if you're in the middle of a valley, God is with you in the middle of it. And he wants to walk next to you. Is Psalm 23, which says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because my God is with me. I think some of us in the room need to know that God is the with us God this morning. And here's what I want to say is the quickest way out of the valley isn't to find the way out. The quickest way out of the valley is surrender. The quickest way out of the season of discouragement is on our knees, surrendering to God's leadership, saying, God, even though I don't understand, I trust that you're a good leader. Even though all these things are happening, I trust that you're going to lead me through it. I feel like this morning God wants to bring some of us to that moment of surrender on our knees, and that surrender is going to be your deliverance this morning. And so Peter, Peter is on his knees, and he goes, he, he goes from calling Jesus master. I don't know if you caught that. In the beginning, he calls Jesus master, but when he's on his knees, he calls him Lord. And so he goes from this honorific title, like, like, a, like a, for us, it would be like a mister or a missus, a master, and he goes and calls Jesus Lord, which is a word that is often used to refer to God himself. It's possible that Peter's even recognizing in this moment that there's a divine nature to Jesus. He's understanding him not just as master, but as Lord. And really, this follows a paradigm of kingdom, which is in the Bible. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus comes and says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe. So say repent. Repent has to do not just with like weeping on a microphone, but repent really has to do with changing our thinking. And so Peter goes through a process of repentance when he changes his thinking about Jesus from master to Lord in that you're not just some awesome person, you're actually king and God. There's a changing of his thinking that happens. But the second part of that verse, it, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent and believe. Say believe. And believe isn't just what we might think about it, some mental exercise. In the Greek, uh, the word believe has to do actually with changing our behavior and how we live it out. And so Peter goes on this journey of changing his thinking, but then it follows with a changed behavior. And at the end of this verse, uh, or the section, it says, when they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. So Peter has this encounter on his knees, experiencing Jesus in a new way, but then it looks like something in his life after, and he leaves everything to follow Jesus day by day. And so here's what I want to say is that faith is more than just trusting Jesus on a Sunday morning. It's following Jesus on a Monday morning. Does that make sense? The, the Sunday morning is great for changing our thinking and changing our understanding, but it has to look like something on Monday morning. The Sunday morning power has to turn into a Monday morning pattern. And we call that here at the Rock and well, in the Bible, we call that discipleship. Discipleship is as simple as this. It's following Jesus every day. And so Peter goes on this journey of, of discouragement to on his knees devotion to then discipleship to Jesus, learning what it looks like to follow him day after day after day. Does that make sense this morning? So I want to share just my own personal story. You know, uh, youth camp is coming up in uh, 25 days, which is crazy. But every year at this time, I just start to reflect on my own uh, camp story where my life got radically changed in 2010. Uh, and I was a sophomore in high school in 2010. And I came into camp. Um, I, I remember I was telling everybody that I wasn't going to go to camp. And it's Wednesday before. We were leaving on Friday. It was the Wednesday before camp. I get a text message. And someone texts me and says, are you going to camp? And I text back and I say, no, God's telling me not to go to camp. <laughs> Has anyone ever spoken ahead of the Lord before? You've said something that maybe God might not actually be saying. So all of a sudden I send that text message. I'm like, shoot, well, I never like even prayed about this. Like, 
And so I, I take a moment, I remember I was in my kitchen, I'm between the refrigerator and the, uh, the sink, and I kind of stopped to pray, I have my phone in my hand, I'm like, Lord, are you asking me to go to the Rocks Winter Camp? And I just felt, some of you know what I'm talking about, I just felt that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit saying, yes. And so I text right back, I'm like, just kidding, I'm coming. <laughs> sign up two days before camp. And I'd come from a conservative church. And so when I show up at this camp, um, really for me, it was a season of discouragement. It, it was a valley season. And, and I'd come from a conservative church. And I, I was dealing with so much shame, so much fear, so much condemnation, so much guilt, so much loneliness. And some of you know what I'm talking about. This season of my life, I, I remember, it was feel, I, I felt like I was walking around all the time with giant weights on my shoulders. And there's such a heaviness in my life. And I show up at this camp, and initially, um, everyone's like, dancing and all these things in worship. And I remember initially, I was so offended um, and I think I, one, number one, because I'd come from a conservative church, and this was the Rocks camp, and so everyone's like all excited to worship, but really I think what was going on is because I was in so much shame, fear, and condemnation, I was offended that they were experiencing a freedom that I didn't, I didn't have. And so I stood in the back just judging everybody, and then it kind of came to just a breaking point on Sunday night. And I was like, I, I just, I'm just done. Like, I, I want the freedom that I see these people having. So I, so I walked down to the front uh, during worship. And I remember I, I, I didn't see anyone around me. It was just like me and God. And some of you have had those moments where it's just like, it's just you and the Lord. And I closed my eyes and I have this moment where I say, God, I want to give you my shame. I want to give you my fear. I want to give you my loneliness. I want to give you my discouragement. And I remember just lifting my hands in surrender. And it was like God lifted the weight off of my shoulder. It was like God himself reached into my heart and took out the fear, took out the shame, took out the loneliness, took out the discouragement. And I remember feeling light for the first time in my life. And so just naturally, my eyes were closed, and I just began to dance before the Lord for the first time in my life, because it was like, it was all I knew how to do. I was like, I feel, I feel free, like, I just, got, I don't have this weight on me anymore, and I, and I all of a sudden opened my eyes and look around, and everyone else is dancing, too. Like, I didn't dance because they were dancing. I just danced because I genuinely felt free, and then I realized, I was like, this is what I was just judging people for, like, 15 minutes ago, but I'm free. Like, this is real, and, uh, and I was also, I come from a conservative church, and so I had to convince, I had to just remind myself in my head as I'm dancing, I'm like, this is biblical. David did this in the Bible, <laughs> but I got set free. The quickest way out of the valley is surrender. The quickest way out of the valley is surrender. So I, I want to make some space for the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. So if you want to close your eyes, you know, I was reading an article this week about just how busy we are as 21st century Americans. And at church on a Sunday morning, we don't want to just make your life more busy. We actually want to create a space for us to sit and breathe and rest and relax. So I want to have a moment here of stillness. Uh, Sam's going to play on the keys, but we're going to have a moment just to respond uh, to what the Holy Spirit's saying. So just, just with eyes closed, if there's anyone in here saying, you know, I, I experience a lot of stress. It's hard for me to be still because of the stress. I want to pray for you. Just lift your hands if that's you. Yeah, God, we just invite your stillness to come in this room, in the midst of the busyness and craziness of, of culture today. God, we invite you to come with your perfect peace to our hearts. I break the power even of uh, clinically diagnosable anxiety in this room. God, we speak uh, even to serotonin levels to be balanced in this room. In Jesus' name, bring your peace, God. I just want us to reflect on this. A couple questions here, because we, we want to have a moment of personal response, and then we're going to stand and pray as a room. But just personally, I want you to identify what's an area of discouragement in your life right now. What's an area in our lives where we're feeling discouraged? Just take a moment and identify what that is. Yeah, thank you for speaking, Holy Spirit. Again, this is just a moment for us to be still. 
and reflect on our lives. The second question I want to ask, and it might be a unique question, but I want to ask the question, who are you surrendering to? And what I mean by that is not just kind of the Sunday school answer of Jesus, but what part of God are you surrendering to? So for instance, if the discouraging area is finances, maybe there's an invitation to surrender to God as the provider. If there's discouragement in relationships, maybe there's an invitation to surrender to God as a reconciler. God is a heavenly dad. So who are you surrendering to? What aspect of God are you surrendering to this morning? Let's just take a moment and identify that. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. And then the last question I want to ask is I just want to make a space for this because, again, we, we love the power of a Sunday morning, but our heart here at The Rock is to disciple leaders that transform culture. So we want this to look like something for you on Monday morning, on Tuesday morning. So what is that surrender going to look like tomorrow? And what I believe is God's going to speak to some people even about patterns or you could call them spiritual disciplines in your life. Maybe uh, God might be inviting some of us to, um, if if finance is an area, maybe God's inviting you to have a pattern in your life of giving as a way of saying, God, I trust that you're a provider. For some of us, maybe it's stress and anxiety of our job is the area of discouragement. Maybe God's inviting you to turn on the audio Bible instead of the radio on the drive to work one morning a week. So what's that pattern in your life that can put in place that surrender? What's that surrender going to look like tomorrow? All right, here's what I want to do. Thank you, Jesus, for speaking to us. If you, like Peter, find yourself in a moment of discouragement, and you're ready to get on your knees before Jesus and surrender to him, I just want to invite you to stand. If that's you, just say, just, I, well, I, let's, let's stand all across the room. Let's stand before Jesus. But I feel like there's some people specifically. Here's what I want us to do is I just want to put ourselves in a posture. If you're ready this morning uh, to surrender to Jesus, to find yourself at his knees, I want to invite you to put your hands out in front of you. You know, we could lift our hands and surrender, but I think there's something powerful about putting our hands in front of us to just say, God, we're ready to receive what you have for us. So I want to just invite you to pray with me. God, we want to be open to what you have for us. God, we want to find your leadership in the middle of valleys of discouragement. And God, we surrender to you in the middle of the valley. God, we surrender to you in the middle of the valley. I just want to invite you, even just put it in your own words, just say, God, I surrender to you. Say, God, I surrender to you.